Well now that the Hack Together channel intro is done, welcome to my first video of hopefully many to come. My tag on the internet is usually here and now live, but since it's a bit of a mouthful, you can just call me Mitch. I'm a software engineering graduate that lives up in Canada, and since I graduated I've been developing games. Now you must be wondering why a game development channel is doing tutorial videos. You're right, it's strange and it's not really how I wanted to start this channel, but honestly after how bad some of the tutorials I had to skim through were, I felt it was important for me to do something to make it easier. I mean, they aren't terrible, after all I learned from them, but they're so chock full of stuff that just confuses people. As for example, why are there different setups for graphs depending on which tutorial I look at? Apparently no reason because it's just different notation. However, to a person who has never learned this concept before, it would look a lot more involved than just notation. It also doesn't help that the tutorials don't state that fact either. I mean, this looks a lot different to a person learning than this. And if you don't explain concepts to people, they're going to get confused. Regardless, hopefully after this tutorial you have a deep understanding of Dijkstra's algorithm. It can be used in turn-based games like Fire Emblem, or more practical applications like Google Maps. Without further delay, let's get started. Alright, so this is the first section of me explaining Dijkstra's algorithm of many to come. Um, there are two main, main sections, which are going to be first steps and more advanced, and then I'll have a conclusion. In first steps, we're going to cover basically explaining why the algorithm exists in the first place. Um, then I'm going to tell you three steps of the algorithm, which are just repeated iteratively, and the zero step, which is just setting everything up. And then I'm going to show you a simple example that's going to be as simple as possible so you can fundamentally understand what's going on. So first, let's start with the first part. Um, explaining why the algorithm exists in the first place. So if we go into this graph here, um, every shortest path of algorithm is a graph. There are node, 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 and I should say B here. And these are paths that go between the nodes. So every shortest path algorithm is you'll have a bunch of nodes and a bunch of um, paths between them. You can think of this as like street junction, street junction, street junction, street junction, street junction, and roads between them. It's a real world example that makes it easier to understand. So basically why Dijkstra's algorithm exists in the first place is that there's something called greedy algorithms, which kind of preceded Dijkstra's algorithm, at least I think. And they had a fundamental problem with them. So if you go from starting from A here, and your desire is to go to B, then obviously, if you're trying to go to the fastest path, you have to make a decision here, you either can go this one meter route, or this three meter route. You can do one or the other, but you can't do both. You have to choose one path. You can either go this way in total or this way in total. Now, this is the problem with greedy algorithms. When they chose between this and this path, they would do a simple calculation. They'd say, okay, which is the shortest path to the next node? Which means, okay, let's compare. I have this path here and this path here. Which is smaller? Well, three is bigger than one. So that means one's a smaller root. So it's, the greedy algorithm would go, okay, then I'll take one. That's the best root, it's shorter. However, you can see how this goes off the rails really quickly because one meter, it's like, oh yeah, one meter, that's not that bad. And then it's five meters and you're, and you're basically equivalent to the bottom path. And then you have to go another six meters and then yeah, you've just traveled 12 meters when the bottom path, if you just did this route, going from this node to this node, you would have only traveled six. So that's obviously not what you want to do. Like six is smaller than 12. So there was something wrong with greedy algorithms in problems like these. So what they came up with was Dijkstra's algorithm. And Dijkstra's algorithm would scan each of these nodes and actually find, oh, the shortest path is actually here. And that's what it would go with. 
So it would actually return the six meter path. So instead of traveling, if you used a greedy algorithm, this whole route, suddenly you'd actually get the accurate path of this route. That was the big advantage of Dexter's algorithm. And it eventually gets built upon with stuff like A star and more advanced concepts like that. So yeah, that is the first section. And um, yes, I will explain the three steps next along with the zero step. All right, so what I went over before was why Dexter's algorithm exists. Now what I'm going to go over is what the steps are to actually complete it. So how Dexter's algorithm works is there are four major steps, and one of them is basically a setup. So first thing I'm going to do before I even jump into step one, or zero, should I say, is just explain to you my notation because I made a big point of that in the previous um, uh, part of this video. Basically my notation is going to be this. The red numbers here, 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 and here are going to represent like the identifiers for these nodes. So if I say node 1, I'm referring to this guy. If I say node 2, I'm referring to this guy. Node 3, this guy, and etc. The orange is going to be the weights of this graph. Or should I say like the connector lines value. Basically whenever you hear I me say edges just say connector lines in your head. It'll make your life a lot easier. So these edges have values that are denoted by these orange numbers. And finally, what I'm going to color in inside the nodes are the weights to get to any specific point. So like the distance you can think of to get to any specific point. So starting off here, in step zero, what happens is that you first make basically everything, all the weights, to get to every node, infinite. Every single one. Infinite, because the idea is you have no idea how actually long it would take to it, so they might as well be infinite. However, the one thing you do know is your starting position node. And you know since you're starting there, there's no distance, so that's gonna be zero. So it's zero. And from that, that's literally step zero. That's the setup for the graph. The next portion, and you'll never have to go back to step zero again, is picking which node you're gonna evaluate. So there's a this step is an evaluation step. So basically we have zero, infinity, infinity, infinity. Those are our weights. And there's a calculation done that says, okay, out of all of these nodes, one, two, three, four, which has the smallest weight? So looking at this, two is infinity, which is a no. Three is infinity, which is also a no. Four is infinity, still a no, but one is zero. So with that, we know immediately, like one's the only choice. That's that's the only choice for us. So choosing one will lead us to make this node permanent, which means that with this node chosen chosen, we state that like from this point forward, we won't include this in any other step one process. So now that we've said, okay, one has the permanence for this iteration because we're basically what happens is once you get to step three you just do step one and two again so for this iteration we said one is permanent so one's out of the game now you might as well like build a wall off here like once we evaluate that it, it's not relevant it'll hold data it will still be there but we, we really don't care about it anymore but what we do will do in the next step 
is what really makes Dijkstra's algorithm interesting. So in this step, what we'll do is we have this, 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 and this. So our zero, infinity, infinity, infinity. And now with this permanent and us starting from this position to actually do calculations, step two is where the magic happens for Dijkstra's algorithm. We will now change the values of two and four by calculation. And how that calculation works is that if we take the permanent node's value of zero and add whatever the weight of the edge is, so one in this case, for one to two, and it's less than the value of two's weight, then two will become the weight of whatever the whatever is here. What that means is that with this calculation, two now becomes one weighted. And then this calculation, since zero plus three is less than infinity, because three is less than infinity, we basically forget about infinity and we make three that new weight for four, for the four node. With that, we now have different numbers. And you can probably might start to think like already how this would work. Now you go back to step one, you evaluate one as the main guy because it's smaller than three in infinity. And then you go from there, you change the value here, etc., etc., and it would eventually finish all nodes. And I might as well just do three, which is literally just, as I said, simple as that. Those are the three major steps for Dexter's algorithm and obviously step zero. So with these steps outlined for you, the next thing I'm going to do is actually go into an example. That's going to be super simple. We're going to go through it together and hopefully you'll be able to get it. All right. So now that we're done the steps of the algorithm, uh, we're going to go through an actual example. So in this example, what I'm going to do is I'm going to explain to you in very basic terms how this would actually play out in a practical graph. So as you can see here, I have the same notation as last time. Um, there's the weights and then the number for each node. So I'm just going to jump into this. So first step we mentioned is that we are going to make all of these nodes in Fandy except our starting node. Our starting node will be zero. But every other node will be turned to infinity because the idea is that we're starting from this location trying to go to every other node. And since we don't know the distance to those other nodes yet, we just state them as infinity. So with that, we do the first step, which is basically saying out of which of these nodes, this one, this one, this one, and this one, which of them is the least value and right off the bat we can say like this one because zero compared to infinity it's not a it's not much of a contest so this one tur is turned permanent and we begin looking from here so right off the bat we do the calculation for the second step which is from our permanent node we would change the value of both this and this because if you remember from step two, zero plus two is less than infinity. So this node will become two. If I just erase this, put in two here. The same thing will happen down here. 0 plus 1 is less than infinity. So that node will become 1. So that's 
what you've seen before in a previous graph, and that's what we stop. But the algorithm doesn't stop here. Um, since this node is now done, we are now going to go pick our next node. And we're going to do the same calculation that we did at the very beginning that was very trivial, where it was zero and all these infinities. But now there's actually different numbers. So if we look at all the nodes that are in play, because we don't care about this one, it's done now. Um... We have 1, 2, and infinity. So 1 is less than 2 and less than infinity. So you can say pretty easily that 1 is our lowest node number. So that becomes permanent. Now that this is permanent, we will go and do the next step which is changing the weights. And since A is done and this node is the only option, we're going to change the weight of our endpoint node. So when we do that, infinity will be changed to 6 because it's the value of this node plus the value of the weight of the connector line or edge. So it'd be 1 plus 5, which is equal to 6, which is less than infinity. So 6 is our new number for this node. Now, as you can see right off the bat, here, if the algorithm just stopped here, we'd have the same problem that I mentioned before. This is why, De what I'm about to show you is why Dexter's algorithm is actually useful to find the shortest path. The algorithm doesn't stop and just go to this node and say, oh, I'm done, I have the shortest path here. No, what it does is actually, it'll do the calculation again of which is the smallest node, and it will say, oh, 2 is actually the smallest node now. So it'll go from here. And with 2 being the smallest node, it will evaluate this one again. And as I said, it's this plus plus this. So 2 plus 3 equals 5, which is less than 6. So 5 takes over the spot. So I erase the 6, and I put in a 5. So yeah, it's almost as if this path now dominates. And that fixed the problem that we were I mentioned at the very beginning, the fundamental problem of not finding the shortest path. Now, with that done, this node finishes. And now there's no other nodes left. Um, there's just the final B node. So we can circle this and make it permanent pretty much immediately because it has no other sections to evaluate. And that's it. That's the first example. So I hope you guys understood stood it. And um, yeah, that's Dystrix's algorithm right there. Okay, so this is the final section of the tutorial. We're going to do an advanced example for you guys. Um, this should be really illuminating to like what Dijkstra's algorithm can do in a more like practical or bigger example. And also, um, I'm going to introduce parenting in this example because it will show you how to get the shortest path back out from the algorithm. Because everything I've shown you has found the shortest path, but it's never shown you a way to like get that shortest path out. That's when parenting comes in. And I'll explain that as well while I'm doing this. So I'm going to go through this much quicker. And yeah, uh, I will go through this example thoroughly. So you guys have an example of how to do bigger stuff like this. So to start off, it's a traditional problem. A, B. You want to go from node 1 to node 4. So we start off the algorithm, 0 at the one node where we're starting, infinity, 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 and infinity everywhere else. And we'll just begin to evaluate. So 0 is the lowest um, valued uh, node, so it's going to be made permanent. And then we just evaluate its two neighbors, which will evaluate to 1 and 3 because 
0 plus 3 is less than infinity and 0 plus 1 is less than infinity. And here's where parenting comes in. Because this, eva this node evaluated these two, they, these nodes will now dictate that their parent is this node. You might already be able to see if we do that parenting lines back all the way to the final node, we'll have our shortest path. We'll be able to trace it all the way back. So let's continue on with the algorithm. Um, node 2 with 1 is the smallest because 1, 3, infinity, infinity, uh, 1 is the smallest number. So we make this permanent. And then we evaluate. Um, 1 plus 2 is equal to 3, which is smaller than infinity. So we make this 3, and we state that this is its parent. 1 plus 5 equals 6, which is smaller than infinity, which makes this 6. 1 plus 4 is equal to 5, which is not smaller than 3, so we don't do anything to that guy. And then we leave that node, and now we have an interesting situation, because you have two 3s. 6 and the infinity are obviously too big, but two 3s, so the same number, what do we do? Honestly, this is a kind of funny situation where you can do really whatever you want. Um, as long as you pick one of these, the, the algorithm will work out. So I'm just going to pick this guy, make him uh, permanent, just preference. There's no, there's no special specialty anywhere. And if I try to evaluate, because this guy's permanent already, so we don't care about this edge anymore. Um, I try to evaluate this guy, because he's not permanent. 3 plus 6 is 9, and that's not smaller than 3, so it can't do anything. And this guy's already permanent, so this becomes permanent, and we forget about it. Now we go to the other 3. So 3 plus 5 equals 8, so this doesn't change. 3 plus 1 is equal to 4, which is less than infinity, so this does change. This becomes 4. The parent is set here. Now basically at this point we already have our shortest path because you can tell a 6 node is not going to change this to a smaller value. So from 4, 5, 2, 1, that's our shortest path. But I'm going to finish this anyways just for process's sake. Um, so the next smallest node is 4. 4 plus 4 is 8 which is not less than 6 so we don't care about that, and then 6 is just on its own, has no nodes, everybody else is permanent, but don't worry about him, because he's going to be permanent as well. And then the graph is done. That's an advanced concept, and as you can see, we've returned our shortest path. So this goes backwards, so you don't read it as 4, our shortest path is 4, 5, 2, 1, you read it as 1, 2, 5, 4, because we start from here and we go to here. And that's how we return our shortest path. In implementation, um, you'll see how all of these things work out. And I'm considering doing an implementation video down the line, potentially, as a part two to this. But I think for now, just giving a basis of theory is good enough. So that's it. And I hope you enjoyed uh, the story video. Um, and I hope you have a more detailed understanding of Dexter's algorithm. Thanks, and I guess like, subscribe, whatever, or don't. I, I really, it's up to you. I don't, I don't make choices for you. You can make your own decisions. <laughs>